Oh, that's a very loud voice. I want to welcome you all to the New York State Complete Count Commission. My name is Jim Alatris. Uh, I'm the co-chair on behalf of the other co-chair, uh, Secretary of State Rosanna Rosado, who couldn't be here. I welcome you. Um, this is our fourth or fifth hearing, fifth hearing, and we're really happy to be in Buffalo. Um, I want to turn it over to the mayor, but before I do, we love being in Buffalo, Mayor, because the place is booming, and that is a large part because of you and your work. And all the, the tide rises, all boats from the East Side Workforce Development Center that we just saw you announce recently, it is really going gangbusters. So we are really happy to be here. You are doing great work. We are gra gra grateful for your service, not only on this commission, but with everything that you're doing in this great city. Um, I'm happy to be back here with no snow. And I'm happy to be here when it's warmer actually in Buffalo tonight than it is in Albany, New York. So we may just stay a while and enjoy the city. I know Esmeralda and I are going to go have some fun tonight. So I'd like to turn it over to your great mayor, Mayor Byron Brown. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Chairman Malatris. And let the record reflect that it is 76 degrees today in the city of Buffalo. And in fact, scientists have declared that Buffalo will be a climate refuge city in the future. I want to welcome all of you to Waterfront Elementary. It's always a pleasure to visit this diverse and creative learning community. I'm grateful to Buffalo Public School Superintendent Dr. Kreiner Cash and Waterfront Elementary Principal Terrence Jenkins for supporting tonight's event and allowing us to host the hearing in this beautiful facility. I also thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be part of tonight's important public hearing. This is the fifth, as you heard, in a series of public hearings sponsored by the New York State Complete Count Commission. The next hearing is scheduled for Friday, April 26th in Utica. It's important that we as a community continue to work together to ensure that every resident is counted in the, two, in the 2020 census. I thank Governor Andrew Cuomo for his leadership on this issue and working with state legislative leaders, Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins and Assembly Speaker Carl Hastie for creating the state's Complete Count Commission. A special thanks to Majority Leader Stuart Cousins for appointing me as a commissioner. In Buffalo, we have formed a Complete Count Committee, and we are also working closely with my colleague, Erie County Executive Mark Polencars, and the Erie County Complete Count Committee. As mayor of Buffalo and as a member of the state Complete Count Commission, I'm pleased that this hearing is being held in Buffalo and I welcome you to our city at a time of positive transformation and economic growth. In fact, since 2012, there has been more than $6.7 billion of economic development activity in the city of Buffalo. I have had the opportunity to learn a great deal from attending hearings in the Bronx and Suffolk County. And I can tell you that there is tremendous enthusiasm and energy all across the state of New York to make sure that we have a complete count. I'm pleased also to recognize Commission Co-Chairs Jim Malatris, President of the Rockefeller Institute of Government, and Secretary of State Rosanna Rosado, as well as my fellow commissioners who are here today. Yesterday, in Buffalo, we provided an update to the residents of our community on what we're doing here in Buffalo to ensure a full, complete, and accurate count. Our complete count campaign is called Buffalo Count Us In 2020, and you can go to the City of Buffalo website for more information. It is particularly important that we are here today because Buffalo is ranked number four in the nation with children under five 
in hard to count census tracts. Buffalo Count Us In 2020, fortunately, is gaining great momentum. Our committee continues to grow, and it includes diverse uh, leaders in all sectors of our community. I thank Jessica Lazarine, Director of the City of Buffalo, Office of New Americans, and Deputy Corporation Counsel for the City of Buffalo Law Department for cheering the Buffalo Count Us In 2020 campaign. It is critically important that every Buffalo and New York State resident is counted in the upcoming census. The need for a full, complete, and accurate count is vital to Buffalo and our state's future. Again, I'm pleased to host today's public hearing in Buffalo. I personally welcome all of our attendees, and I look forward to today's presentations and testimony. Now it is my pleasure to turn the microphone back uh, to co-chair Jim Malatras. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let's give him another big round of applause for all the great work that he is doing. Before we start, so we have two presentations today, and then we have a bunch of folks who signed up uh, for the public comment period. We have a clock. We like to stick to three minutes, not because we don't want to give you more time. If you have written comments, submit them and we post everything that you have in written comments on our website. Even if you don't have written comments tonight, write them up and we'll post them on our website and everything is then also done by transcript because we have a lot of folks who want to make sure we get to everyone. Um, in Suffolk County, we had a lot of folks that signed up too. It's great to hear from everybody. We want to just make sure that everybody has an equal opportunity. So we have a couple of presentations that I'll announce in a second, but before we turn over to our main presentation and then our public comments, I'd like just to have our commission members introduce themselves, and we'll start with Mr. Bellow um, to my left. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, my name is Adam Bellow. Um, I am the uh, uh, Monroe County Clerk. It's a pleasure to be here today in the city of Buffalo, uh, and I look forward to your testimony uh, today to make sure that everybody, we have a complete count here in Buffalo and across New York State. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm Lauren Moore. I'm the executive director of the Pioneer Library System in Canandaigua, New York. I am also the chair of the New York Library Association's 2020 Census Committee. I am a member of the, the Finger Lakes Digital Inclusion Coalition, um, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So good afternoon, uh, Jose Calderon, President, Hispanic Federation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for this wonderful weather. Buffalo is always beautiful. Today is just glorious, so thank you for inviting us here, and we're really excited to hear from all of you. Thank you. Esmeralda Simmons. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Law and Social Justice at Medgravis College, part of the City University of New York. Very happy to be in, always happy to be in Buffalo. Thank you. Uh, I'm Richard Toby. I'm Executive Director of this New York State Complete Count Commission. Uh, and also with us today uh, is Jim Leary, uh, who's uh, our counsel and secretary, Matt Heakin, who's the director of research, uh, uh, Mona Abdullah from the New York State Department of Labor, and not here but working hard on census matters today in Henrietta is Elizabeth Burakowski, who's also is deputy director of the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. I'd like to call up, and let's, the staff of the commission is doing a lot of work behind the scenes. They have to put up with the Secretary of State, but mostly me, so let's give them a big round of applause for all that they're doing. And I'd like to uh, reiterate to this, Mr. Jose Calderon's statement that Buffalo is beautiful. It is even beautiful with eight feet of snow, and it's mostly beautiful, it's really beautiful at 70 degrees, so we really like to be here tonight. Uh, let's call up our first uh, presentation, uh, Jeff Baylor from the Census Bureau, and then we'll turn it over to Kara Mataliano uh, from the Community Foundation, and if I said your name wrong, you will correct the record, of course. Jeff, it's nice to see you. It's wonderful seeing you again, Co-Chair Malatras. Thank you very much, Commissioners, Mayor Brown. Thank you for hosting this event. So I have a 45-minute presentation. I'm going to cut into about 10 to 15 minutes. So I'm going to be, we're going to be jumping through sides, slides here, but we're going to focus on the main topics of really what the 2020 census is about. So, uh, Ed, if you would jump to the uh, job slide. <clears throat> so there's two things that we kind of focus on uh, when we're working with our partners. The first is help us recruit. Census is a national event, but in order to be conducted, 
uh, complete and accurate. It has to be, in order to get a complete and accurate count, I should say, it has to be conducted at the local level, meaning we need people to work in their own neighborhoods. We're, we're opening up an office here in Buffalo, Hurtley Avenue. Uh, it should open up in June and July. We need to make sure the managers understand the challenges of this area. We're going to be hiring supervisors and clerical staff. The majority of positions that we hire on a census are, are part-time temporary workers called enumerators, which we'll be paying uh, in, this, in Buffalo, throughout Erie County, and the, the northern portion of upstate New York here, $17 an hour. It's a pretty good job, $17 an hour. And you can work for us part-time and be extremely successful. You can work nights, you can work weekends, and still get as many hours as you would like to do. So we need your help in getting the word out that the census is hiring. 2020census.gov backslash jobs. If you don't want to listen to me right now, go online. It's formatted for your smartphones. Apply. Anyone you know who may be interested, please share that link with them. Ask them to apply for census jobs. We're going to start our mass, our first mass hiring event this June. So it's important if you're interested in working in our first operation called Address Canvassing, which starts in August of this year, get your application in as soon as possible. Okay? So what's the second thing that we cover? with our partners. We are asking them to become census ambassadors. We're asking them to start having the conversation with their, their community members that it's safe, that it's easy, and that it's important. So if you go back to the safe. Three messages we want to share. There's a law called Title 13. And what Title 13 does, it, it protects every piece of data that we collect. By law, the Census Bureau cannot release any information that would identify an individual or a household, period. Not to local, state, federal law enforcement, not to Homeland Security, not to immigration services, not to housing boards or uh, housing uh, enforcement, no one. We cannot share information that would identify an individual or a household, period. In addition, every one of us who works on a census is sworn to an oath of confidentiality. We could be fined up to $250,000 and prison up to five years if we release any information that identifies an individual or a household. This is the foundation of everything the census does, the public's trust. So the census is safe. The census is easy. Four ways to respond to the census. First time ever you'll be able to respond online. We're excited about that. By phone. We've always had a telephone, toll-free telephone component where we provided support to individuals. This will be the first time that you can actually fill out your census over the phone. You can call at one of the toll-free numbers and provide your information. If you prefer to fill it out on paper, everyone will get the opportunity to fill it out on paper if they want. It just may not be the first option that they get. And then finally, the largest operation, the most costliest operation we do in a census, we hire over 375,000 people for an eight-week operation to go out there and knock on doors asking the same questions that the people could fill out online, over the phone, or on paper. So what are those questions? This time around, name, it's a short form only census. Name, age, date of birth, your race and origin, whether or not you're of Hispanic origin. We're not sure yet about the citizenship question. We know that the Supreme Court has oral arguments next Tuesday. Uh, we expect a decision sometime in June or July. The relationship. What is your relationship to the first person listed on, your, on the form, such as mother, father, son, daughter? Gender, tenure, whether you own or rent your home, and then we have some operational questions. That's it. You didn't hear me say social security number. You didn't hear me say anything about asking for money, for checking or, or banking credit card information. If you hear those things, it's a scam. Okay? All right, next slide, please. So I want to talk briefly about online. We are driving people to fill out the census form online. Roughly 80% of the nation, the very first mailing they get from us in March 12th through the 20th on, in, in uh, calendar year 2020, is going to be an invitation to go online. And with that invitation, there's also going to be a list of toll-free telephone numbers. And I'll go over those in a, in a second. Mailing number four, April 8th through the 16th. If we haven't received a census response from an address by April 8th, we're going to mail out a paper form to that address. So every address will have the opportunity to fill out the census on paper if that's what they choose. Okay? We're excited about both online and over the telephone will be available in multiple languages, 12 non-English languages. You can see those languages that are bolded 
will be available online. You just drop down menu where you select the language. We will also include a listing in the mail out of 13 toll free numbers, each of those numbers assigned to a language. So if you speak Russian, you call the Russian toll free number. Someone who speaks Russian will pick up the phone, answer any questions, and if you prefer to give your information over the phone, you can do that at that time in Russian. The background, uh, those languages in the background, a total of 59. Um, that we'll have language guides available online and in print. We certainly understand there's more than 59 languages spoken in Erie County and in the city of Buffalo. Where that comes in, uh, it, it, we use our partnership program, and, I, and I'm, I'm so happy that here today, uh, Amy Brombos, our partnership coordinator. Amy, if you would stand up, please. If you haven't met Amy yet, you need to. She is coordinating all the partnership efforts in upstate New York. She is leading a team of wonderful partnership specialists working for you, making sure you have the information you need to make sure that your county, your community, your city, your neighborhood gets the most complete and accurate count. So if you haven't met Amy yet, make sure you get her your business card so we can get some meetings set up, get you information that you can start sharing uh, with your community members. Okay? And I should say, one of her team members, uh, Ed Walker, uh, was gracious enough to, to flip the switches for me here, so thank you, Ed. So it's safe, it's easy, it's important. Over $675 billion of federal funding is disseminated every year based upon formulas that use census data. So what is that, what is that for? Well, it's Medicaid, it's highway, highway planning and construction, Section 8 housing, national school lunch program, Head Start, foster care, and health center programs. George Washington Institute of Public Policy did a, a study in fiscal year 16, and they determined that in the state of New York, looking at the largest 55 federally funded programs, that the state of New York receives $73 billion of federal funding, okay? If people choose not to be counted, if they choose not to fill out the form, that means their neighborhood, their, their city, their county, the state of New York, will suffer, receive less federal funding, not just that year, but for the next 10 years. We get one opportunity to get it right. And we need your help in ensuring that your community members understand that the census is safe, that it's easy, and that it's so important for their community members. Okay. So let's jump down to the map, I think. If you, oh, uh, back up one, please, first. So just a, a, a timeline, people ask, well, you, you know, we want to partner with you, what should we do? Well, right now we're in the education phase of the census, okay? Now's not the time to go out there and tell people, hey, wait by your mailbox and wait for that invitation to come to fill it out, because it's not going to come for a while. So right now we're working, identifying partners, educating them on what the census is, and maybe more importantly, what it's not, um, in preparation for the awareness phase, which will start in January. We have a national media campaign. We'll also be doing a lot of local events with our partnership program and our local partners starting in January, getting the word that the census is coming, talking again, reiterating about how important it is and how easy it will be to fill it out and, of course, how safe it is. And then in March starts our motivation phase. That's when the mail-outs will start. That's when the online system will be available that you can start filling out your census response. And we'll have a reminder phase. We actually start knocking on doors May 13th. So you, you will have the ability to fill out the census online through July 31st of 2020. We'll start knocking on doors, though, May 13th, if we haven't received your response. Okay? There's some great tools available. City U University of New York put a great hard-to-count map uh, uh, website together where you can really go into your community and take a look at what, we what, what they consider hard-to-count. We have something very similar, census.gov backslash Rome. It's available to the public. Um, but probably most, most importantly is your local knowledge. You know your communities better than anyone, and we have to talk about what are the right messages to get out to the community members, what's the right way to disseminate those messages, whether it's a trusted voice, whether it's a local PSA in language on a, a certain radio station or in print, and we need your help in, in determining that. I wanted to show you a tract on the, on the next slide here in Buffalo. So you see three dark blue, uh, what we call census tracts, and this is a geography, this is one of the lowest levels of geography that we will release data. On the right hand side, you'll see data for that particular tract. All right, that's what the census data looks like. You don't see people's names or, or uh, household information type thing at, at the household level. So that, that 
uh, track, the, the northernmost track there that we have highlighted, you can see track 7101, population of around 3,500. Um, so what we look at here are what are some of the things that may make this particular track hard to enumerate. And we right now believe that 33.3% of the households in that particular track may not fill out their census form. That we're really going to have to work to get them to understand that it's safe, that it's easy, that it's important. So what are some things that stand out? You can see uh, Hispanic, 62.58% Hispanic live in that particular census tract. So the messaging we put out needs to be messaging that, reach that reaches that community. So we're looking for partners who service those community members right now. Other things you can see foreign born, um, those who don't speak English very well. Renters is another one. Um, I'm not sure if I had that on there. Yeah, 81% of the units in that particular tract rent. Renters are an extremely hard to count community. So how do we reach them? Where are locations that renters who move every year, where is a place that we can get them? Is it a church? Is it a certain restaurant? Is it a, a certain store? So we need your help in understanding how to tackle those challenges to ensure we get a complete and accurate count. And you can, you can go to the end. The last thing I just want to mention, again, uh, next slide, it's just our contact information, our partnership program, but see Amy, see Ed, these are the two people that you need to talk to if you're interested in learning more and getting information, flyers, pamphlets, you have some information in your folders. If you want to, if you want to host a job fair, we would love to work with you to make sure people in your community have an uh, easy enough time to apply for the job so that when we get ready to hire, we're hiring locally. So that I thank you for your time and, and uh, look forward to our discussion today. Thank, thank you. you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Before I turn over to Commissioner uh, questions, I'd like to just turn it over to the mayor again for a couple of more introductions in the audience. We have been recognized by a few individuals who I don't believe are going to be testifying today. Uh, but represent different government offices. I want to recognize Bonnie Kane Lockwood, who is here representing Congressman Brian Higgins. We can give her a round of applause. <laughs> Julie Barry, who is the Deputy Commissioner of Planning and Economic Development for Erie County, representing County Executive Mark Polencars. <laughs> and the Erie County Complete Count Committee. Um, Captain Steve Nichols, who is Director of Community Relations for the Buffalo Police Department. <laughs> Shatora Donovan, the City of Buffalo Chief Diversity Officer. <laughs> and Nicole Dry, Deputy Commissioner for Community Services for the City of Buffalo. Thank you, Mayor. Any questions from the Commission? Hello. Good afternoon. Jeff, thanks for that uh, wonderful presentation. A quick question, I think, for, for folks here in Buffalo. So you mentioned jobs, right, $17 an hour, which is, which is great, right? How many jobs are you anticipating here in, in Buffalo, in the city of Buffalo? That's a great question. I don't have the, the total off the top of my head, I can tell you. It, it, probably close to at least a thousand or more during the entire life cycle of a census. Now again, the majority of those are short-term, temporary, lasting anywhere from eight to 12 weeks, plus a paid week of training. Jeff, Jeff how, how successful will these, will these efforts be without community partners? We have to have partners. Um, you know, we call it the Trusted Voices campaign. All of you are trusted voices. Uh, everyone in this room is a trusted voice to other, you know, other, whether it's their community members, whether it's their church members, whether it's their favorite restaurant they go to. We have to have partners in order to be successful. If you rely on the census to do this by ourselves, we will not conduct a complete and accurate census. We have to work together. And is there federal funding to support the work of those community partners? So unfortunately, we do not have a federal funding that can be shared with, with community-based organizations. What we do try to do is, is focus on the jobs that are available, work with them to ensure that we're hiring their staff, their community members, the people they serve. In addition, we'll provide them with all the resources, materials, um, you know, drop-in articles, social media kits. Uh, we will have some promotion materials that we'll be able to share with them as well, but unfortunately, no direct funding. Thank you, Jeff. Um, no, don't go anywhere yet. I have some questions for you. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. 
I know, Lauren switched the mic, so you thought like it was all over. You mentioned, first to Lauren's point, there is state appropriation that was made available. There's been a question of whether it's the right amount, but $20 million for a whole host of things in lieu of federal, a lack of federal funding has been made available. And we know from our presentations in the Bronx, as well as some other places, that local funding might be made available too. So there is That's correct. some room for that. Okay, good. You talked about scams being a big concern, and I've noticed we've gotten written testimony where that's also been a concern. Have you done analysis through the Census Bureau about where those scams are, tar who they target, so there's some way that either state partners or local partners or law enforcement or even federal partners can try to buttress any potential scam activities? I'm assuming they're in some community, disadvantaged communities, other places, but have you done analysis about where that happened? Absolutely. We, it, it would go back to 2010. We know the elderly community typically are, are scams. Um, the majority of scams that we've seen in 2010 were mail out. So a form would come with the word census on the top and then have some questions. Uh, and then, you know, please send your check in with that. So I don't have specifics right now, but I will uh, try and put some things together on those type of communities to share with the, the commission. That would be great if we can include that at least in Absolutely. the record so we can address that piece. Yep. Um, the other piece is we've been, I've been diving more into the data on response rates from 2010 just to try to figure out a way, at least many of my commission members are more deeply involved for many years on this. Um, and I've always noticed there's been some discrepancies about what the Census Bureau puts out on response rates versus I think we've had a lot of testimony from the CUNY, the City University of New York mapping program, where their data are a little different. Um, and given what kind of came out today from the census on re-estimates on population loss or migration, where, how should we really talk, I mean, and we have a lot of hard to reach communities in the state, which we've also been, Buffalo being one real hard, in, in its totality, a hard to reach community. We were in Sullivan County, so we anecdotally know, but how do we rectify some of the differences in data, and sometimes it's the swing's pretty considerable, like 10 points, and how can we make sure that we're targeting the right areas and hard to count the areas that foundations and government services and the government sector is going to target in a real and meaningful way to make sure that we really are reaching those communities that need to be reached? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. The, uh, the one thing that is consistent between the two tools, if you look at it, is the self-response rates from 2010. So that's the foundation of what we're using at the Census Bureau. The self-response rate for 2010 equals the number of households that received a census form, filled it out, and mailed it back in. All right, so I think we had, uh, I want to say it was around a 72% 70, nationally uh, self-response rate in 2010. Okay, that doesn't mean we only counted 72% of the nation. That means we had to go knock on doors of another 28% of households. What we've done, and what's maybe a little bit different from, from Steve Romaleski and, and the City University of New York, we look at what we consider hard to count groups. So we know the fastest growing undercounted group from the 2010 census were children under the age of five. So we take those communities, those census tracts that have a large amount of children under the age of five, and we use that in, the, in our formulas to determine where we think it's gonna be hard to count. African American males ages 18 to 24, another hard to count group. Renters, another hard to count group. So we're taking data that we collect throughout the decade via the American Community Survey, which was the long form back in Census 2000, and adding that to those self-response rates. What we're excited about, what we did in 2010, we'll be doing again in 2020, is starting um, March 20th, we'll release to the public on a daily basis self-response rates for every tract across the nation. So you will quickly be able to see on a daily basis how many people, how many, the percentage of households that have either went online, filled out their paper form, or they called the toll-free number and gave their information over the phone. And then uh, we're working with partners to use that information to target this. If we're going to spend resources, if we're going to do something at the Census Bureau, we're going to try to hit those areas where those numbers are extremely low. One other question, and, and I promise then I'll let you go. About 22% of the total population of New York is foreign-born. I think w roughly less than half um, are non-citizens. Are you tracking, have you tracked the response rate in previous census activ activities on that, 
population directly that we could have access to? Is there more data there? And, and are you forecasting or projecting new data? We're going to be in, in the southern tier region, Mohawk Valley region, next week, um, or the end of next week. And that's where we have a large refugee population, for instance. Are you trying to project data like that as well so we can also see how maybe po population migration in these foreign-born communities are working? I'll have to check with the statisticians and, and provide information back to the commission to see what specific information we have available. I, I can tell you for, t for planning for 2020, it's a component of the formula that we use to determine hard-to-count areas. Uh, we will also be doing a test um, that starts um, in May and June, a mail-out, national mail-out test with the citizenship question on it to see some will get it, some won't, just to see what kind of responses we're, we're getting back, the, the lack of responses, I should say. I think some of that will feed into it, of course, once we have the decision. Uh, but, but, of course, as we heard from the public testimony throughout so far and from partners, um, a lot of them feel the damage has been done with, with you know, the, the discussions that we've had, the, the even threat of including that on the census form. Any more questions from the commission? I don't, I'm, this might be too in the weeds, but I've been wondering this. When you think about how you deploy resources, you know, knowing that it's mostly the, the people power that you'll be employing, are there certain hard to count populations that are harder to count than others, where like the amount of work it takes to get into those tracks or reach those certain people who are typically hard to count? Is, is there some sort of analysis like that? I'm not sure if we have data on that or not. I can just tell you from a field perspective. Yeah. When we're going out there knocking on doors, you know, that the non-response follow-up that starts in May, you think of, of, you know, multiple families living in a single family dwelling. That's always difficult. Mm -hmm. um, you think of locked communities, whether it's high income or low income, uh, th those are difficult. Anywhere where there's fear or mistrust of government is mm -hmm. extremely difficult, and that's why partners are so important. If our partners can lay the foundation that the census is safe, it's easy, it's important. It'll be much easier. Our goal is to have everyone self-respond. We want everyone to fill it out online, to call it in over the phone, or to fill it out on paper. That's the highest quality data we can get, and it's the biggest savings to the taxpayer because we're not hiring 375,000 people to go knock on doors to collect that same information. Okay, thank you. Oh, one more question. Sorry, Jim. So, Jeff, maybe final question, um, and, and getting into the weeds, talking about partners a little bit. So you mentioned you're in the education phase at this point, and, and, and I think that's, that's a critical phase because even those of us who've done this work before, there are always questions that come up, and you know, sometimes you're not 100% sure about the answers. So you get the census, the family gets a census, where you send a census form to the Fernandez family here in Buffalo, um, and now there are 10 people who are living there. We were expecting there to be four people there. Um, oftentimes, partners get asked, you know, how do we fill this out? And, and obviously the answer is obviously, you, you mention everybody who's in that household, who's in, in that apartment. Um, when you do the trainings around the, uh, the education phase and you talk to partners around this, how comprehensive do you get around these different scenarios, right, that can play out in terms of actually making sure that people have the right information? Yeah, it, uh, another great question. That has to be part of the conversation. So we're learning that in some neighborhoods. I mean, we're having conversations with a certain partner looking at particular apartment buildings that maybe they, their community members they serve live in those buildings. And we're learning from them what are those challenges. And they tell us something like that, where we have you know, apartment buildings that are legally subdivided. Again, we don't care if they are or not. We just need to make sure everyone who lives there is counted. So we're working with them to determine what's the right message. This is the toolkit that we currently have available. What do we need? Is there something in this toolkit we can use right now? Or is there something we need to add to it to make sure we get the right person giving the right message to that, that very one apartment that has multiple families living in it to make sure they understand how important it is that everyone who lives there includes their information on the census form? Yeah. All right, one more question for Rio. Yes, sir. Everybody's asking such good questions tonight, Jeff. We want yeah. to keep it as long as we can. <laughs> We've noticed in some of our preliminary analysis of hard to count um, census tract uh, regions in New York State that it always seems to correlate not only into our urban areas, mm -hmm. like if you go upstate, it's usually um, Native American reservations and then our urban centers. And you see it on Long Island, the same sort of yep. pattern fits if it's Brentwood versus, you know, mm -hmm. Syosset. Yep. Um, but within 
when you dig deeper into the actual census track, some of the hardest areas within the hard to count region are where the university centers are. Um, so Buffalo State, for instance, is among the highest. You, you mentioned you were gonna come here. We've talked about SUNY and CUNY a lot. Is there an effort to work with Buff, Buff State, for instance, Erie County Community College and the University of Buffalo here, not only to maybe get some job opportunities for these students who may be reflective of the community, because many of them are from the region, but also as a way to pick up that hard to count community census track. Absolutely, first and foremost, the jobs. When you think about when it comes time to knocking on doors, which is mid-May through July of the summer, that's a great job for students, $17 an hour. More importantly, I agree, it's, we really, we have to partner with colleges and universities, especially when they have off-campus student housing. So we have a whole group quarters operation. We don't have as big of a concern in counting students who live on campus. It's those who are renting apartments, renting rooms off campus, who leave prior to you know, May when we start knocking on doors. Those are the areas we have to work with those colleges and universities to help us get what's the right message. Can we set up events where we invite those students who live off campus to come uh, to an event, maybe with free food or something, and ask them to sit down and fill out their census form right then and there? Make sure they understand that it's, we don't want you to be counted at your, where your parents live where you, you know, you live three months out of the year, you need to be counted where you live the majority of the time. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. We'll see you, you, I think, next week. You're gonna see someone else next week. Right, we'll see you next my week. first one, but yeah. Have a great holiday. Uh, thank you weekend. very much. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thanks. Let's, we'd like to now call up. We will miss you, Jeff. Um, Jeff has literally been to every one of our hearings and takes our abuse, so we, we offer him a great round of applause and a lot of assist for all of his assistance. Uh, we'd like to call up Cara Matigliano, who is from the Community Foundation for Greater Buffalo. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Kara Mataliano. Um, I am co-chairing the Erie County Complete Count Committee with my colleague Julie Berry and with our colleague at the, at the Buffalo um, Complete Count Committee, Jessica Lazarine. The three of us are working very closely together. Be careful, Rich. <laughs> We're, are, are, the three of us are working very closely together to dig into the data and to develop a firm strategy with our partners in the community. In my day job, I'm the Vice President for Community Impact at the Community Foundation for Greater Buffalo. And as the Community Foundation marks 100 years of serving this community, we are committed to connecting people, ideas, and resources to improve lives in Western New York. Getting an accurate, authentic census count is vital to ensuring the quality of life for every resident of New York State. As you know, an accurate count in 2020 is critical to preserving New York's share of federal funds for education, healthcare, community services, and economic development. As a foundation that provides support to these areas, we know every dollar makes a difference for New York residents at every stage of life, and we'll need every partnership we have in this community to be successful. Some people have been underrepresented in the census for decades including rural households, immigrants, renters, low-income households, and young children. People of color, both urban and rural, have a higher risk of being undercounted by the census than other population groups. Failure to address the trend of undercounting will ultimately deprive historically marginalized communities of vital public and private resources over the next decade. To ensure every person is counted, Every step must be taken to remove all barriers to census participation. We must address, address issues such as the many languages spoken by residents, fear of how data is used, inequitable access to the internet, and the need to increase trust in government and public service. In the 2010 census, there were concerns the immigrant population may not have been accurately counted as Buffalo recorded a 10% loss in population. Today, national rhetoric about immigrants may instill fear and prevent them from completing census questionnaires. 
It's imperative that we partner with trusted voices and the immigrant and refugee communities to express the importance of filling out the census and doing so in languages they can easily understand. Jeff mentioned that um, we that it is against the law to share census information, and we need to reassure people that um, their private information is private and will not be shared with anyone else. Uh, also, as Jeff mentioned, the 2020 census is going online for the first time, and there are new fears about cybersecurity. So to maintain public confidence in the census, we will all need to be vigilant. The state should work with the federal government to move aggressively to uncover any potential illegal attempts to gain information and prosecute the perpetrators to the highest extent of the law. We all need a clear, consistent message that explains the difference between legitimate requests for census information and unlawful internet scams. And we've already heard about this. We must also connect with the communities with poor internet access. While 80% of households in Erie and Niagara counties are online, Western New York is marked by deep digital deserts, neighborhoods where more than half of all house households have no home internet or cellular data plans. In the Broadway Fillmore District of Buffalo, fewer than two in five homes have internet on some blocks. Access to broadband is a serious inequity on its own. Failing to count these communities just multiplies those inequities through the loss of federal resources. We should take this opportunity to make sure everyone is connected. And to help address these challenges, we need government, nonprofits, and faith leadership to work together. The Community Foundation is bringing resources, knowledge, and partnerships to this important task. Uh, as I mentioned, we're co-chairing the Erie County Complete Count uh, Committee in collaboration with the Buffalo Complete, Complete Count Committee. And we're also bringing philanthropic resources as we serve on the steering committee for the Census Equity Fund, a statewide group of funders who are passionate about ensuring every person is counted. And the goal for the Census Equity Fund is $3 million, and now we're, we're at $1.8 .8 million currently. We are encouraged by the resurgence we've seen in Buffalo and the trend toward an increase in population for our region after many years of steep decline. According to the latest Census Bureau estimate, Erie County population has grown by more than 6,000 residents since 2010. It's vital that we capture this increase and get the appropriate resources for the next 10 years that reflect the true population. We're grateful that New York State has allocated $20 million to preparing for the census. As the state looks to distribute funds for community-based, trusted organizations for the hard-to-count populations, I would like to encourage the state to use a simple process. Many of the trusted voices for the hard-to-count populations need a simple, expedited process to apply for state funding. No community should be left out due to complicated technical funding applications. We need a funding process that enables partners to engage communities efficiently and effectively. For the next year and beyond, we'll be working side by side with government, community organizations, faith leaders, schools, and neighborhoods to make sure every Western New York resident gets counted and that our state gets the resources we all deserve. The Community Foundation is honored to support the census as we work together for, for a vibrant, inclusive region with opportunity for all. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Before I turn it over to our, uh, my fellow commissioners for questions, we just want to note and thank the community um, network across the state, the foundation network, for stepping up to the plate. We've heard from folks, whether it's the Dyson Foundation in the Mid-Hudson here tonight, um, um, and all over, and it's a really a critical partnership. So we thank you for stepping up and helping out this really important cause. With that, I, I'll turn it over to my colleagues with some questions. So thank, thank you so much, Kara. Thank you for your presentation, and, and really insightful and, and helpful, and, and clearly philanthropy is so important in, in this effort. And so just to, as a point of clarification, you mentioned $3 million. Is that for the greater Buffalo area? 
Yeah. No, that's actually statewide. statewide. So it's, it, I wish it could be more, and we continue to raise dollars, but they are being distributed statewide. There's actually um, three different rounds of funding that are going out over the course of the next um, year. And, and any sense, just because we're obviously here and, and, uh, and, and our concern at this moment is, is the greater Buffalo area, any sense of, of those $3 million, how much will be allocated here? We don't have a perfect sense so far, but our hope is that more of those resources will be allocated across upstate, including Western New York, because downstate has a whole lot more philanthropic resources than we do currently. So we, our expectation is that downstate funders will provide a lot more funding um, downstate and that the three million, much of it will be allocated across the state. Yeah, and, and obviously there's a lot of work to be done in this space because um, clearly, uh, we have $20 million from the state, uh, we, we hope, and certainly that's going to be uh, our expectation and push. Um, and we know, you know, based on the work that we did back in 2010, uh, that much more money and resources are needed, and so philanthropy sort of will fill some gaps, and, and we have to figure out where else we fill gaps. But I, I love your point, Kara, around the simple expedited process and doing this and making sure that the state learns from foundations, uh, from philanthropic partners who have been doing this work for a long time, who have been engaging CBOs for a very long time. And, and I really, you know, thank you for mentioning that because I think we, we need to learn, right, and not recreate the wheel uh, from folks who have been doing this for a really long time. And would love to see if, you've, or if you're already thinking about, hey, this is what we're going to do, right? This is going to be the one pager we're going to be asking of our CBOs to submit uh, for, for funding because uh, we certainly would love to see that as commissioners and really uh, be able to recommend a very simple process uh, for getting these funds. We would stand ready to help at any moment. Just ask and we will all be there. Um, so I want to thank you for mentioning privacy concerns. That's uh, something the library community is actually very concerned about and is starting to do preparatory work in this area. Um, so although data is protected um, on the server end um, of the census, through the census pr process, we know that uh, data at the point of data entry is actually vul is vulnerable. Um, and vulnerable populations that are typically, who are typically more often surveilled or more often um, nervous about participating in an online environment because of surveillance and that sort of thing, um, th these people are the more often targeted. And these are the hard to count populations already and these are the folks that are often forgotten when policy decisions are made. So I'm curious um, how privacy concerns got on your radar, what Phil philanthropy is willing to do in this area, knowing that it's not the most high, high profile area, but it's an important one, I think. It, it's actually huge. We've already had people ask us questions about this. Um, we don't have a good answer yet. I think the answer lies with the partners that we will all have in our community because they know how to talk to people on the ground better than philanthropy would because we want to work with the people as close to the ground as possible. And our partners in government are going to have to help us with that clear, consistent messaging about what is a real census request and what is not a real census request. I'm actually very worried about that um, because there's so many um, there's so many things out there already. Um, so knowing that three million dollars is your goal, you only have 1.8 million dollars now. It's not a lot of funds to distribute statewide. Um, one of the things, one of the things, one of the challenges that I found in talking about census preparation, especially um, in in a climate where we're not resource rich, we're resource poor in this effort, um, the tension between serving metropolitan areas versus rural areas, knowing that there are more hard to count bodies in cities, um, but also knowing that if we devote all, or designate all of our resources there, then the rural regions are going to be perhaps undercounted. Um, and in, under, in rural regions, those funds don't go as far. The infrastructure doesn't exist. Reaching each of those people uh, takes more effort, more capacity building. Um, is this a tension that your organization is navigating? And where, how, are you, how, are you, uh, how are you navigating this issue, if you are? So we don't have a strategy quite yet. But it's something that we are all going to have to use our imagination about. Um, one of the ways in which we reach people is to go where they are. So any place where there are um, community institutions, churches, VFW halls, schools, any place where rural people gather already, those are probably our best shots. Um, and the same is actually true in the city. And um, I think that we are going to find out more about it from our partners.
And so you're, right now, um, the Census Equity Fund is focusing both on urban and rural areas. Yes. Um, thank you for the work that you do. Um, I'm very interested in the fact that you and your organizations and your coalition organizations have contacts with uh, what we're calling the trusted voices. You know those groups. You've been funding them. You've been working with them. Um, so have, have you offered lists, a list of those voices to the complete count committees or even to um, this commission so they would know who those, those groups are? They would know better than uh, taking a survey. So we have offered lists to the complete count committees and we are working together um, without, without exposing our strategy too soon. Um, our intention is to bring them all together so we can have like a town hall meeting about how are we all going to do this and continue to work with people into the future. But you're right, we, we work with nonprofits all the time, we work with community-based organizations all the time, we make grants to them all the time, and so do our colleagues in philanthropy. So I think we have a pretty good sense as to who they are. Um, particularly uh, refugee communities, um, uh, immigrants, and uh, families or individuals who have suffered some sort of a, a trauma. Absolutely. Again, we are making grants to them all the time, and Jessica particularly has expertise in the immigrant and refugee community as the Office of New Americans. Um, one more question, sorry. Um, thinking about those 20% of New Yorkers that don't have internet access at home, um, and those 50% of those tracks that are, exist in every city and every rural area, area or those 50% of people that don't have internet access at home, um, is the Census Equity Fund partnering with libraries or intending to, um, to, to, to direct funding towards libraries? Yes, there will be a partnership with libraries. That's great, thanks. Okay, Kara, quick question. Um, I told Kara when I saw her when we first came in, we, I formally held the job she now has, so we're, we're good pals. <laughs> but I asked her to get ready for a, a Mueller question or something. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, rich, rich. We're, 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 Point of order by we'll, the co-chair. We'll, we'll, we will no refrain from that. <laughs> um, but Kara, can you give us an idea of how the Erie County Buffalo Complete Count Commission is being organized and how many people are involved and sort of how you anticipate it proceeding. I know it's built uh, on the, I think, very successful opiate task force that County Executive Bolengars had, had formed, but could you tell the commission what's sort of envisioned uh, and how you think that will go forward? So, um, I guess I can do that to the extent that we have it planned out. Um, we plan to work very closely together, Erie County and Buffalo. It, we are one as a community, and so we intend to work really closely together. Um, our first step is to really dig very deeply into the data with the help of Amy at the Census Bureau. It's to really dig deeply into the data about where the hard to count populations are, and then develop sort of a, I would say, a draft strategy that we will engage the community in and then revise it based on the community's input into what they think really needs to happen. So, and so we're in the early stages. And, and you anticipate a very large number of people engaged, in, involved? Oh, we have to have a very large people, number of people engaged. This, this is so very important. You just can't underestimate the importance of this to our community. So yes, we are going to in, engage every man, woman, and child we can possibly do. And so when the county executive signed his executive order, he said something like 100 people may be involved with the commission itself. So it, it, you're looking like a, at a massive countywide engagement of that sort, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, thank you very much for coming and testifying. Thank you. Okay. I feel like I'm about to sing a lounge song every time I hold this, so I apologize. I'd like to turn it over now and start the public comment period. We're going to call uh, you up. If I state your name wrong, Please just on, before you start, just state your name so we have it on the record officially because everything's being recorded and it just helps us as we proceed in the process and formulate our report. Um, the first person I'd like to call up, again, we have the three minute timer. Once it stops, we're going to uh, move on to the next person. So just indulge me with that. Thank you. Um, I'd like to call up Kate um, Meyer, who is the staff member to Assemblyman Sean Ryan. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> you got it perfectly, uh, Mr. Chair. Kate Meyer uh, for Assembly Member Sean Ryan. Um, Assembly Member Ryan, who represents the 149th State Assembly District, did want to be here tonight, um, and unfortunately, his appendix had other ideas. Uh, so we both gratefully uh, appreciate the committee's indulgence in letting me come and convey his sentiments to you all. Excuse me, the commission. Uh, so what Sean wanted to let you know was, as you well already know, it is extremely important that we accurately count everyone across New York State. Here in Western New York, we have a unique set of difficulties that we need to plan ahead for. Um, as we heard, it's expected that the 2020 census will be the first online census, or primarily online census, and there's no doubt that we live in a digital age, but we need to keep people without easy internet access in mind. Um, Assemblymember Ryan's district office is in the 14213 zip code on the west side of Buffalo. According to the latest census data, one out of every three households in zip code 14213 did not have access to broadband internet at the time of the last census. Um, obviously, that's almost 10 years ago now, but you can expect that there's still quite a few number of households that don't have that access. Um, this will make completing a digital census extremely difficult for these households. So we need to focus on how we reach people without the ability to connect to the internet and ensure that they are included in the census count. We also need to provide some help to those same people who may not be familiar with technology required to fill out their census. And to that extent, I would note here that Assemblymember Ryan is the new chair of the Assembly's Libraries and Education Technology Chair, or excuse me, committee. Um, He's only been chair for a short time, but I can say without exaggeration that the number one issue we've heard about from libraries across the state is their concern with the burdens that will be placed on them um, from their communities and them trying to access libraries for both internet and informational help in filling out the census forms. Um, uh, and so we know that libraries will be heavily utilized, and as libraries always do, um, we'll be ready, willing, and able to meet the challenge, but hope we can support them as much as we can. Uh, finally, data shows that there are dozens of different languages spoken by people living in Buffalo, as we already heard. And so in order to accurately count our population, we need to ensure that the 2020 census will be available to languages that people understand. Um, and so to that end, uh, community-based organizations, uh, as you already heard, will be crucial to getting an accurate count across the state. Uh, that's really all I have, not telling you a lot you don't know, but appreciate the opportunity to come and represent the assembly members' concerns. Thank you, Kate. Kate, don't go anywhere first. I have one question since the assembly member is the chair of the committee. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion about uh, broadband access, and the state has put in a lot of money to cover the entire state with at least 100 meg. So the real issue, I feel like it, it's underserved community. You don't have access or affordability. You have access and affordability issues, not necessarily like not having any access whatsoever. What are some other ways? Libraries are one, trusted stores. Lords raised that, Commissioner Moore's raised that, um, I think pretty well at, the, um, at many of our hearings. And we've heard uh, that te uh, testimony uh, in all of our hearings that libraries are trusted stores. What are some other ways the state or local governments can facilitate more broadband connectivity for the purposes of the census um, and get the word out that way? You don't have to answer now. Maybe that's something that you can, uh, the chairman can help us with later on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate uh, not having to answer that now. I know that um, broadband and high-speed internet access for all of New York State's communities have been an, a long-standing issue. Um, hopefully one that the legislature can adequately address sometime soon, but into the near future and certainly past the census count will continue to be an issue um, that plagues a lot of our households. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd now like to call up Mary Jean J Jakubowski. Sounds good. Was that all right? You, you did just fine. Thank I you. married into it, so I take it however it's said. <laughs> uh, good evening, and thank you so much for allowing us to speak uh, this, uh, this evening. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to direct my first comments to you. Hi, Byron. Um, I know very well um, 
that you recognize the importance of having everyone counted, and I'm sure that you have uh, written down that the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library will absolutely be represented on your Buffalo Complete Count Committee, uh, because we certainly recognize, as I know you've just heard, and what a great segue, to the importance of the role of libraries in this uh, Complete Count. Um, I, I want to give you a, just a couple of statistics here. In the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library, we have over 1,000 public access computers. We serve the Buffalo and Erie County residents with 1,700 service hours per week. Per week. I think that says a lot. I think it says a lot to how many people can come into our libraries to fill out their census forms. What's most important is that we need your support in doing so. I'd like to encourage uh, the continuation of the conversation of funding for additional, uh, whether it be service hours, which requires staff, or again, computers. I said we have 1,000 computers. I can tell you every single day, nearly every single service hour, those computers are being used. And I know that you don't want to take away those service uh, opportunities uh, for solely for the purposes of the census. I think you'd all agree that collaborations are crucial, and public libraries, of course, have a long history of working collaboratively with a variety of programs and services throughout our, our communities. Uh, we must absolutely work together, and I ask that you, as a commission, also encourage and promote the role of public libraries and libraries in general. Uh, you spoke about Buffalo State College, Erie Community College, common factor amongst all of them. They have libraries, and libraries are trusted. It's where people go. It's where people gather. So I ask that you promote uh, the use of libraries for the purposes of the collection of such, such data. Um, those are my remarks for this evening. I think you're probably going to hear this over and over again. And I also want to thank the commission for having libraries rep represented on the commission. Thank you very much. OK. Andrea O'Sullivan. And you're going to correct that for the record. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Andrea O'Sullivan, and I'm director here in Buffalo of a community based think tank called Partnership for the Public Good. Um, and we work toward a more just, sustainable, and culturally vibrant Buffalo Niagara through action research, policy development, and civic engagement. Um, and at Partnership for the Public Good, we unite 294 partner organizations across the region. And each year, our partners participate in a democratic process to come up with what we call the community agenda. Um, they propose, refine, and vote in their top 10 priorities for change for the year ahead, and for this year, 2019, laying the groundwork to ensure every resident counts in the 2020 census was voted the third priority on our community agenda. Um, and why is that? Why do our partners feel this urgency and care about the census? Of course, we have many partners who provide direct resources in these communities. Um, we have many who the federal dollars make a big difference to them and the populations that um, they serve. And also, of course, our own research as a community think tank is deeply affected. Um, census data is so important to painting this accurate, accurate picture as we push for policy change. So as a result, we're already engaged in efforts to reach hard-to-count neighborhoods and populations locally, to educate partners on the importance of the census, and to build their capacity to engage their own members, their clients, their neighbors toward a complete count. Um, so in the months ahead, we're planning community-based research on the local barriers and perceptions on census taking, uh, to create local resources such as a fact sheet about the, what are the myths and perceptions here, um, hosting capacity building workshops, and aiding our partners in developing their own get out the count um, campaigns. And in fact, we've already drafted a policy brief on why the census matters for Western New York that maps, first of all, the historically undercounted neighborhoods, then we map the neighborhoods with limited internet access, and within those, then, we map where are our public libraries and where are our PPG partners 
from immigrant services organizations to cultural groups to block clubs and community centers. So we're already mapping out these dozens of our partners that are the trusted voices in these communities. Um, and those are the ones that we'll invite to participate in this capacity building too. So our research so far in 2010, we know that Erie County had a response rate of 80%. But just to jump into the most hard to count census tract here, for example, which is quite similar to the locally 20 hardest to count census tracts, had a response rate of just about 58% and has home internet access of only 32%. So we see that as a, a real challenge. And in closing, I would just echo Kara and the Community Foundation that among these partners, it's really our request to know um, how can they access some of the 20 million and to really encourage that to be a very community-friendly process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before you go, if you would submit or talk to our staff to make sure we're getting your mapping and information, we'd love to post that and make sure it's part of our record. Thank you I'll very do much. That. Thank, Thank you. you very much. and I'm with the New York Immigration Coalition and a member of New York Counts 2020. I'm based here in Buffalo and work with our members throughout Western New York, including in the Rochester as well as the Finger Lake areas. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the census today um, and how we can work together to ensure that we have an accurate count of all communities in Western New York. I'm disappointed that the state budget allocated only $20 million for the census, with no specific set aside for community-based organizations. As we stated earlier, $20 million is not nearly enough to conduct basic outreach in hard-to-count communities, and shows that New York is not taking seriously the threat of an undercount. We are also concerned here in Western New York that the bulk of that funding will go downstate leaving our already under-resourced communities with very little funds to cover the vast geographical as well as incredibly diverse communities. I ask that the commission work with the governor and the legislator to allocate an additional 20 million, whether through the Empire State Development Corporation or other avenues, more funding is needed. An undercount jeopardizes the over $73 billion in New York State receives annually, and through the 55 federal funded programs, among other things. Upstate cities, especially Buffalo, have changed vastly over the past 10 years. In great part, thanks to the new immigrants and refugees, we have made strides to reverse the population decline that has plagued our cities for decades. In order to truly show who Buffalonians are today, and how many of us there are, New York State must ensure that immigrant and refugee communities are accurately counted and therefore safeguard adequate funding for the next 10 years. With the overall culture of fear and distrust in the federal government, this is not a small task and is not one that government can do by itself. Unfortunately, regardless of what happens with the Supreme Court rules um, in terms of the citizenship question, the legacy of that question and the fear that had the damage has already been done in our communities. New York State must fund the community-based organizations that have the trust in the relationships in these hard-to-count communities. The additional challenge of the census being online, language, as well as literacy barriers makes it particularly important to fund CBOs. We see that top, the top languages like Karen, for example, in Buffalo, is not included in the 59 languages. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to continuing to work with you all to ensure that all New Yorkers are counted. Thank you very much. I'd like to call up Janice Dekoff. Just one more question before you go. I apologize. Uh, Megan, yep. what was the language you mentioned uh, that the commission, we want to have it on the record? Karen. Um, so there's the top, um, I think I have as a part of the written testimony, but a part of the top 10 languages in Buffalo, three of them are not a part of the 59 um, languages that are included. Great, thank you so much. Yep.
Good evening. Good evening, and you did get the name correct, which is fantastic. Again, my name is Janice Deckoff. I'm the executive director for the Chautauqua Cattaraugus Library System. Our system serves 38 libraries across two counties, and I'm asking the Complete Count Commission to support libraries in receiving a portion of that $20 million that has been earmarked for those census efforts. A recent Siena poll confirms that New York is currently headed towards a devastating undercount that will impact our representation in Congress and threaten federal funding. By providing funding to support libraries' involvement in census efforts, we increase our chances of retaining both representation and funding. Libraries are the heart of their community. They're uniquely situated to play a major role in the success of the 2020 census. Libraries are trusted institutions across the state and the country. Community members know they can rely on their libraries for accurate information, quality assistance, and easy access to internet, both inside and outside library hours. The trust that libraries have established with their communities will play a vital role in the success of the census. It is currently estimated that libraries will invest an additional 150,000 to 175,000 staff hours assisting patrons with technology to allow them to complete the census. With proper funding, they will be able to educate and assess our community members with the challenges completing the first online census. 25% of the households in our service area are without access to internet or computers at home, and they rely on the libraries for those needs. Our communities have seen major employers leave the area over recent years. Many of those people who've lost their jobs are heading to the library to learn how to use computers for the first time. Senior citizens are coming to the library to take classes and learn that they can have confidence in using the internet for a variety of tasks. There are many people in our communities who simply don't feel comfortable conducting business such as banking on the internet. All of these people will need complete support uh, for the online census that was designed for those who have access to the internet and are computer savvy. While our libraries are eager to be leaders in complete count efforts, the lack of sufficient funding that has persisted over the last decade is a major barrier. Every year, libraries see rising needs in their community and strive to meet them despite inaccurate funding. Providing census funding to libraries across New York State ensures that we are adequately prepared to spearhead efforts. This will result in a more accurate count of our population. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up, we have Katura Capod Capodonia. Capodonia. It's like Malatras or Malatras. You can go with either of mine. Each. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Katura Cavadonia. I'm the outreach consultant at the Southern Tier Library System, and uh, I will echo some of the things my fellow librarians have said. Um, our system serves 48 public library outlets in five counties, Allegheny, Chemung, Schuyler, Steuben, and Yates counties. Uh, the majority of our libraries are rural and uh, in isolated geographic areas. Uh, more than 24 million Americans do not have internet access at home. Older adults, rural residents, racial minorities, and those with lower levels of education and income are less likely to have home broadband. America's libraries are the leading source of no-fee public access to the internet, Wi-Fi, computers, and technology training. As we prepare for a 2020 census that will be largely digital, libraries are well positioned to serve as community hubs for those who do not have access to the internet or internet connected devices at home. In 2018, only 86% of households in New York State had a computer and only 78% of households had a broadband internet subscription. Locally, from 2013 to 2017, 27% of Allegheny County's households had either no internet access or dial-up only. According to a recent analysis from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, a public library is located within five miles of 99% of the hard-to-count census tracts identified with the lowest response rates in 2010, and 79% of the time, a library is within a single mile. Libraries can bridge the digital divide. 
For example, at the Southern Tier Library System, we have partnered with the Southern Tier Network to provide affordable broadband connectivity across three counties. In 2010, Southern Tier Network began designing, building, and operating a dark fiber internet infrastructure in Chemung, Steuben, and Schuyler counties. The network is now fully established and continues to expand. More than 500 miles of fiber have been constructed to connect rural communities to broadband internet. Additionally, libraries offer a place to overcome barriers to access for individuals living below the poverty line. In the southern tier, more than 72,000 people are living at the federal poverty line or below. In our service area, 26% of children are living below the poverty line. The free programs our libraries offer reach an audience of thousands of children and families annually. As such, libraries are well positioned to help enable a more accurate count of children ages birth to five. During the 2000 census, libraries hosted more than 6,000 official census outreach sites. Libraries also offer a public space that can function as temporary workspaces for census staff, as well as for community stakeholders to host events related to the census. New York State's public libraries are uniquely positioned to assist in ensuring an accurate count, especially in our rural areas where libraries are centers of community, activity, learning, entertainment, and access to information. Thank you. Thank you very much. And perfectly timed. Uh, next up is Faustina uh, Palmatier. Good evening, everyone. My name is Faustina. I'm an, an um, MSW student at UB and a lead volunteer and liaison for the current Society of Buffalo. As many of you may or may not know, there is a large uh, po population of current in the city of Buffalo and the neighboring cities such as Rochester, Syracuse, Utica, and Albany, and et cetera. Um, Buffalo alone has a population combined of Burmese origin estimated to be 8,000 or more, and the Karens are the majority. I'm here to speak for the Karen in Buffalo, and if I may, for the, all the ethnicity from Burma, such as Chin, Mon, Arakan, Kareni, and other ethnicity. I want to address the concerns and issues um, surrounding you know, this census data gathering for this um, 8,000 population um, of people from Burma. Um, they also represent a portion of New York and who are, they are the people you know, who are hardworking and their, their voices need to be heard for many issues they are facing due to language barriers and traumas they have gone through and are still going through. If, a, if I may, I want to raise concern how it is difficult to get counts, you know, head counts for refugees and immigrants in general across New York State, who we meet at churches, mosques, monastery, and other community agency and centers. We can reach out to our brothers and sisters if funded wisely. I'm here to let you know that um, the current Society of Buffalo is a grassroots um, organization established three or four years ago and it is resourceful to collect um, data for you if given the opportunity. We have built a mobilized network in the community with churches and monastery, and is, you know, and we are able to uh, do outreach in the community. And it is important to have representation in the community, and we have that, and we are willing to work with you. Thank you all, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Aurora Shank. Hi. My name is Aurora Shank, and I am here as a representative of Buffalo State College's Civic and Community Engagement Office. Our office's mission is to pro provide the tools and means with which students, faculty, staff, and community organizations can live out their values of active citizenship and social responsibility. 
We are happy to hear that the city is leading census efforts and to support the goals of the Buffalo Count Us In Committee. Although already deeply involved and committed to the Buffalo community, our office continues to develop and strengthen partnerships with organizations and leaders across the city. We view Census 2020 as a critical community effort that will have lasting impacts on our region. The college has already been mentioned a few times in this testimony, and our role in the impact of accurately representing our community and our college students in the Census 2020 cannot be understated. Through civic engagements at Buffalo State, we will engage our students in community service and paid positions to ensure an accurate representation of the region, of which two-thirds of our students call home. We are committed to ensuring that city residents and college students are counted. We plan to assist with efforts across the campus and community to bolster the empowerment of our young leaders with the tools to engage their neighbors in the count. Data represent, demonstrates how accurate census reporting, even on a college campus, matters. In 2010, Northwestern University, the college had a 98% response rate on the census as a result of campus efforts to count their students. These efforts resulted in $4.3 billion from the federal government being added to the city of Chicago in the last decade. This demonstrates the importance of an institution to a city and a region. And verifying the students that reside on campus, in apartments, and in homes throughout the region are educated on the financial impact of the count will be a priority in our approach. We will be using Northwestern as a guide. The issues and concerns of 2020 are not lost on us. We know the hard come up communities have increased in size in collaborating, educating, and empowering our students from the refugee and immigrant communities. We will play a role in ensuring this community is represented in the count in a way that respects and honors our neighbors. In our partnerships with the city and more than 100 nonprofits, we can support the work being done to accurately count the seniors, homeless, transient, and formerly incarcerated populations. With technology at our fingertips, we can assist. With institutional support of this work across the campus and our office's connections to broader networks such as the Westside Promise neighborhood, we will be involved in the process with our community and higher ed colleagues. We welcome being part of this conversation and are committed to being proactively involved with the commission as well as our community partners across the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's not a democratic country. I work for the Center for Elder Law and Justice um, over four years, but for the first time ever, I'll be counted in my life. That is on a personal level. That means a lot for me. I'm fully engaged, and I look forward to being engaged to have the world out and having my community get counted. On a community level, I will echo all of my predecessor who did talk about a community-based organization. Buffalo is known as a city of a good neighborhood. It's not an individualist city. We believe it will be wise to think of finding community-based organization. We, as immigrants and refugees, have a word of mouth based community. We prefer to rely on our leaders, our pastor, imam. So it will be a regret and it will be, a, I would say it, a mistake not to take into consideration those communities. And as much as we can, I believe we should think of funding those organizations, because that is where the word can get out. And most of us here may know about census. It's not the case with our members. We, we, that will require much effort, much uh, education, because we should start explaining them what is a census. I say it, I'm 40. But that is my first time ever to get counted. It's not much more on me, but those who are out there. It will be important to think of 
the community-based organization. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, Stephen Sanya. Sanya. Hey everyone, my name is Steven San Yus. I'm the president of the Burmese Community Service. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization in the city of Buffalo. We founded in uh, 2013. So, uh, I would like to say that our organization really support to this uh, census card for the 2020. So. Uh, we know that this is benefit for the government and the, our community. So that we need to educate, this is an idea, educate and promote and motivate for the, this process for the community. In the meantime, uh, we had to identify the challenging people in the country, uh, the county, and including how and what action to take up. Because we do have many challenges. Even the language barrier and technology uses for those people, especially refugee and immigrant people. Uh, some people already mentioned that our population, our people from Burma, is Burma have many different ethnic groups in the city. Uh, the, the language and diversity, including Karen, uh, Karenese, Burmese, Chin, Rakai, more. So we do have eight major ethnic city in the, uh, in the Burma. So the Burma is main major language. And uh, the current is most population in the city of Buffalo too. But some of them, they both speak Burmese and the current. But the ethnic people, they just mention their own ethnic. So that's a very important when we had to call and identify what they would like to identify for that. So that's a one thing to are uh, important. And also, I would like to ask that it ancient and promoted for the community. This is a very important how we had to be uh, promoted and aware of this issue. How and uh, how we had to be explained and what benefit they will get for them. So, so we had to share the information with uh, the, the public system, the school system, the highway system. So all those things we had to share our, our own people. So that's what very important to involve with the community leader, community-based organization, and uh, make sure to identify who is, who is at a person and who, what organization is at it in the city of Buffalo. So we do have, as I mentioned that, we do have many different groups organization, so that's a very important. So, and also the language and the target rules, ethnic, and the translation and interpretation is those important too. The, the production, and including social media, that's our outreach for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, Jessica Lazarin. Good evening, commissioners, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate everyone's time. I just want to close us out by reminding everyone that the City of Buffalo has launched a web page, and we do actually have some of those job opportunities that Jeff talked about earlier posted on the website. We're going to be periodically updating it to include that employment information. We're hoping to work collaboratively with Kara, as she said, and the county to you know, promote whatever activities uh, that are needed in the community to get the word out and to build that confidence and give people the tools that they need to respond accurately and completely to the census. Um, we do have a email address on the website. It is buffalocountessin2020 at city-buffalo.com. And if you'd like to be part of the efforts or if you have ideas, suggestions, please let me know and I will share them with the commission. Um, so thank you so much, commissioners, for being here. Thank you, everybody give Jessica a big round of applause for all she does for the Complete Count Commission. 
the local commissions are just as important as what we're doing here, even more critical. So we really appreciate everything you do. Um, on behalf of the commission, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. This is really helpful as we are providing, uh, pr putting together a report to provide to policymakers in Albany. So this is a critical part of what you're doing and what we're doing. So thank you. I want to thank, again, the great mayor of the city of Buffalo, Byron Brown. Let's give him a big round of applause. Our next meeting is Friday, April 26 at 10 a.m. Utica, in Utica. If you're around, please come. Utica is a beautiful part of the city, uh, part of the state as well. Um, if you celebrate uh, Passover or Easter, have a happy Pesach and Easter. And uh, thank you very much for coming tonight.